I would rather now choose to take a medal from World Games than from WOC. I would just emphasize the importance for Czech runners to really realize that Compass is good friend for you. There is like more factors in that in the uh, rising popularity. Keep your focus, stay in your in your bubble and just focus for what you are doing because every second it's counting and you are just losing them. I think every year we are doing record and breaking new record. So nice. this year we reach uh, 15,000 of uh, orienteers. All right, welcome everybody. My name is Tom and this is Into the Forest I Go, a channel where we are talking about orienteering, a sport where you run with the map and compass. And if this is something that grinds your gears, then stay with us until the, the very end. Um, because we today have uh, um, something new on this channel, something that I we didn't I didn't really talk about yet with any of the athletes, and Teresa Anushikova was kind enough to join me for this chat, and we will be talking today about how orienteering looks in um, Czech Republic in this episode. But in general, I wanted to give you a little bit of a perspective how this sport looks like in other countries all around the world. Uh, so we are starting with Czech, Czech Republic. We are starting with Teresa. Uh, a prominent athlete, um, already a medalist from the, the World Orienteering Champs. I think you've got the silver medal, right? Uh, but also a multi-medalist from Jaywalk and AOC. Welcome, Teresa. Thank you for a nice invitation. Welcome, everyone. Awesome. Uh, so I wanted to start with uh, some general view of how orienteering looks like in Czech, Czech Republic. So um, I, we are neighbors, basically. I mean, you don't live in Czech Republic now, uh, but uh, Poland and, and Czech Republic have a, a, have the same border. Uh, so sometimes we go and visit uh, your country either for orienteering competitions, uh, but we also actually go um, almost every year for a some uh, sorry for a winter training camp over there uh, to Czech Republic, and we do some cross country skiing because you get somehow more snow than we get, we get in Poland. So we usually are just, just across the border uh, doing some cross-country skiing. And it always amazes me how many people uh, are uh, 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 like are present on, on hikes, on tracks, or in the forests, biking, walking, running, compared to uh, just you know across the border in Poland. So I think my, my personal perspective, you will tell me if it's true or not, but my personal perspective is that, that the Czech people are quite keen uh, about sports, aren't they? Well, so uh, for the beginning, I would like to just maybe present like how the Czech Republic, Czech Republic looks like. Maybe most of you know. So it's in the middle of the like Central Europe, let's say, and like the shape. I'm always explaining like a big potato, but basically, yeah, like it's it's like this kind of <laughs> nothing special. <laughs> but what is kind of interesting is that. Uh, Along, along all the borders of our country, there are mountains, mountain ranges. And that's uh, what is quite specific. We don't have any big mountains in the middle, uh, in the middle, like central part of uh, the country. So also for all the other neighbors, uh, I would say that it might be quite uh, specific that you are meeting a lot of people in the mountains. And the reason can be that also the people from the cities they like to escape to the mountains which are along the borders so for you also for polish people it it might be in this way but uh, i would say that it's hard to it's hard to judge exactly if the people are really keen in the sport but i would say that uh, yeah people like to escape to the nature and um, yeah the, most of the cities they are not uh, having this uh, Tight prestige of a good uh, countryside around, so people are really keen to use uh, weekends to get out of the city and uh, enjoy some forest. Um, and also, like uh, with the mountains, it's the diversity of uh, different sport activities is pretty pretty unique, and yeah. we, we we can do a lot of winter sports in the winter because. Uh, Luckily, uh, every winter we still have a lot of snow in the mountain range. It's a different for surrounding of the cities, but yeah, thanks to this, uh, many many people they they like to go for downhill skiing or cross country skiing, and they need to go to the mountain ranges. <laughs> right. So here here is an interesting fact that most of the people listening to this will probably not know about. 
um, that Poland is doing, of course, all the um, all, all the three competitions when it comes to orienteering. So bike orienteering, ski orienteering, and, and foot orienteering. And almost every year, our national champs for ski orienteering are being held in Czech Republic because we don't get enough snow to organize it. <laughs> In the same time, what I know, or I think it was already uh, maybe last year that uh, some ski or competition, they had to be moved to Austria, to the Alps, because there was even better ski conditions. So exactly. I wouldn't say we are still not having the Alps. We are just having our Czech mountain ranges yeah. <laughs> and a bit of high Tatra, let's say, or yeah, uh, but uh, still uh, ski, uh, ski conditions and snow conditions, they vary a lot. So, uh, unlikely, unlikely it's like, uh, the, even the calendar for ski or entering competition, it's a bit unclear and every season it's uh, in big question mark and yeah, like, I mean, I think, it, it is getting warmer everywhere, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I remember right. I used to learn to be cross country skiing, uh, behind my home, but, uh, it's not possible. In <laughs> yeah. Last. Yeah. I, I also remember like, uh, 15, 20 years ago, you you almost couldn't do any orienteering in my region uh, in, in central Poland because there was just too much snow. And to, after two kilometers of running, you were absolutely tired and couldn't go uh, any further. But now we we can almost um, we can train almost the whole winter rather than bigger problems. All right, but let's go into orienteering. How how is this sport popular in Czech Republic? Well, so I would say that it's getting more and more popular, and this is really nice uh, fact. Lately, um, I would say that uh, there is like more factors in that in the uh, rising popularity. Firstly, I think we should mention like the media and some uh, not just like social media, but mostly the media like the televisions, mm -hmm. because uh, we are having pretty good uh, TV broadcasts from the main international uh, events, but as well every um, every Czech champs. It's uh, either being to be live, lively broadcast on the day if it's in the right period of the year and there is some uh, time slot in the TV and it's always in the main sports channel. So the um, how to say like it can it can get to the the really um, big amount of uh, uh, sport fans and. But if uh, if the, we are not uh, lucky enough with the good period, then it's, for example, correlating with some big uh, football or uh, ice hockey or whatever, uh, then they are trying to always make some recap like uh, of of the of this Czech championship. So right. it's usually around like uh, one one uh, hour long uh, long uh, report from from the events, repeating twice three three times in the main tv channel so i think thanks to this like um, quite many of my friends and also like non-orienteers they are saying that uh yeah like they have seen uh, orienteering in tv for mm -hmm. many times during the year even though they are not really addictive sport fans so nice. i think that's that's pretty nice uh also then I have to say that the, uh, this popularity is shown by the numbers that the uh, um, number of reg registered uh, members in our Czech Federation is, I think every year we are doing record and breaking new record. So nice. this year we reach uh, 15,000 of uh, orienteers out of uh, one, uh, 11, 11 million of population. So I think I, I was just doing some comparison with the other countries. So if, if I will, for example, now pick France, where it's around 10,000, but the population is like six times bigger than Czech Republic, then I would say that it's still quite okay, uh, considering yeah. we are like a Central Europe country and not Scandinavian. So it's still not like a nation sport, let's say. Oh, I think so. Like percentage-wise, I think you have a really decent percentage. I mean, it's, it's a lot bigger than Poland, definitely. And in the same time, from what I know, if the numbers are still clear, we should be the second biggest non-Olympic sport after floorball with the membership uh, in Czech Republic. Fantastic. So, yeah, I think that in this way, it's quite nice. And last point, what I wanted to say, what is coming to my mind now, it's also that um, I think our federation is working in a really nice 
nice level with uh, all the development of uh, orienting visibility. So there are many events organized uh, during all the year. Uh, it depends on other regional level or some nation level. They are trying to cooperate with uh, Olympic Committee. So also during, for example, um, Olympic Week or some other big events. So even though we are not Olympic sport, we are still having quite close connection to all this, like the biggest movement of sport in Czech Republic. So if there is a chance uh, to promote or entering somehow, locals are local clubs are always taking part of it and trying to organize some public event for everyone and promote it in a nice way. So I think also thanks to it, uh, from my own feeling, if I compare when I start when I started orienting, which was like uh, nine ten years back, um, now nowadays when I'm saying that I'm doing orienting, most of the people they know what it is and they are not like just misunderstanding it with some orientation dancing or something. So, so that's nice. All right, um, mm -hmm. perfect. So that kind of confirms what I've been. Uh, what, what was my internal feeling as well? That the sport is quite popular and it's also reflected by um, the level of your athletes on the national competition um, field i think uh, so czech republic is usually quite close like nimbling on the top countries and uh, you have you have you have definitely some uh, cases where you are able to reach for the medals you are a perfect example of that uh, so that's that's definitely paying off. Um, all right, let's. Um, how, how many people? Oh, okay. You you mentioned already that uh, you have like fifteen thousand people doing or interviewing. How many clubs do you have in Czech Republic, more or less? Well, yeah, for the clubs, <laughs> I was getting ready, so I just check it, and it's around two hundred, ex exactly two hundred seventeen. But I have to mention that there is a lot of clubs considering just few members that there were some really passionate people who wanted to start up their own club. So it's hard to say really like the what's kind of act, number of active clubs because at the usually at the biggest competition, I, I'm not being so much into the numbers, but I would say it can be between 50 to 100 different clubs. Right. And, and how do the clubs attract the people? So you've already mentioned that uh, they are trying to be visible, part, uh, create events uh, for um, the, 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 the people to join. Uh, but how do you, for example, go about the fact that, you know, th this is what I'm usually um, bumping into when I'm talking to people and trying to invite them into a forest, do some orienteering. It's like, ooh, do I have to run through the bushes? There are going to be spider webs and spiders. There are, there are ticks in the forest. I would never go into the forest because there are ticks and you can scratch yourself. Now, it's not for me, right? So there are quite a lot of people here in Poland doing track running, uh, even, even, even outdoor running um, through like cross country. Uh, but when they are supposed to grab the map and go into the forest, it's, there is a barrier. So uh, how do you go over that? So I think the maybe the biggest attraction or some kind of income of people can be through those public events, what I have mentioned, that in this way, it's there are always some kind of promotion leaflets where you have some uh, link uh, for the websites. And there is one uh, Czech website, which is called uh, startorienturing.cz, basically. And at this website, uh, all the population, they can find well, everything about orienteering and mostly like everything for the beginners. Uh, also with some in um, interactive map of uh, Czech Republic and the clubs, the biggest club in kind of the biggest bigger cities, let's say, or in the region. And yeah, do some do some sorting in the database. So I think this website works pretty well uh, to get some new people uh into it and yeah then I, I think also the for example the link to the website might be also mentioned during or after this broadcasting we are having to the tv so i guess in this way um the number of materials and guidelines that people can find online 
through the just through the Google, I think it's quite high. So if people want, they can always uh, get to uh, enough to get to know enough uh, knowledge to just start the orienteering in their city. And it's the same for for the kids, quite common, I would say, or at least how it works in my city. Uh, it's orienteering is kind of part of free time activity and a leisure center for the children. So I guess also thanks to it, then when it's like uh, parents are having kids and it's like huge leisure center that every every children is uh, like uh, participating in some activities over the week. So then parents are talking about it and it's spreading more and more. So so when you say leisure center, is it like something that is organized for children for, uh, for this yeah, free yeah. time? It's some, exactly. It's something like, you are having some music center, for example. So then you are sending uh, children to uh, learn how to play music or sing. So then we are having some kind of center with uh, leisure free time activities. So at this one, there is, for example, orienteering. And it's also how I kind of uh, get into orienteering that then through it, that it was really directly connected to orienteering club. So there are people from the club cooperating on organizing these weekly activities. And also now uh, my uh, home club, let's say, uh, it works in this way that, uh, yeah, there are, there are like two groups that they are having their own trainings for the, for the official members of the clubs already. But then at this leisure center, there is some kind of beginner's level and uh, there's still quite many children who knows that they are probably never going to take part in the competition because maybe parents are not the biggest fan of it and they just want to offer them some activity per week but still i think it's it's better than nothing that at least by this they can they can find out what orienteering is and maybe one day maybe one day oh. after some period they will decide how, how many times a week is it organized this leisure center for kids uh it's usually just one once a week so it's not it's not that often, but uh, I think it's also pretty nice that orienteering is quite a low cost sport. So yeah. that's also why the like uh, base of the kids is quite high because uh, parents didn't need to spend so much money to put the kids to this uh, leisure activity. Right. And do they have to pay for it to, to send the kid to this or is it free yeah, for I them? Think, I think there is some AI yeah, for sure. There will be some kind of one semester membership payment i, I don't know how it works exactly but i and guess it, it and it's organized during the weekends or during the, the during week the, day? during the week it's it's always like after school and there after is like, uh, okay. there is like some for example some dancing classes as well some uh, i don't know <laughs> some uh, uh like uh hiking trips or yeah, probably, probably some football playing volleyball right group sports yeah maybe maybe i would say that it's really like if if uh, parents are not sure about the sport, for example, and they doesn't want to, they don't want to uh, send immediately the kid to some club, pay high membership fee for it, and kind of uh, say to the kid, okay, you are, you have to do this for at least one a year. They are just trying those kind of leisure center uh, to just uh, to just see how it goes. So. Also, now my one of my niece, she's already uh, eight years old and she's uh -huh. still being being there and she's like so far because she's still like young and she she's not so like competitive type of person. So she's just more going there because of good community of her friends. But uh, yeah, then uh, like if she has a chance to go for a competition, uh, she will go for it as well. But it's not the main reason it's just like to offer them some activity during the week but still like have it more in some physical way plus the plus this uh, kind of technical one and learning something about maps and so on nice yeah i like it um okay what, what's the competition quality when it comes to czech republic how, how would you score it compared to you know other competitions that you are also participating all around the world i would say that it's pretty high <laughs> score it it depends on which scale uh but i would say one of the uh, one of the tops like as czech republic and for example some national quotas ranking we are in like around fifth sixth place by the by the result as a 
elite, let's say. So I would say that in this scale, we have to be with the organizing of competitions. So um, I would say that the level is almost similar as Scandinavian, at least by the organization. Of course, then you need to look at the aspect that not every competition has so um, amazing terrains for orienteering and as Scandinavian mm. has. But I would say that uh, for most of the like bigger national events uh, from the organizing side, it's really good. And uh, it has to be because the usual numbers are over 1,000. It's around 1,500 participants at this event. And so in this way, it's pretty cool. And also then important fact is that we are having a really cool season, uh, spring and autumn one as well. Uh, every eve, every weekend, it's some, I would say, some national competition that either is some championship or other it's like a kind of check cup. And this is, for example, something if I'm again comparing, for example, in France, that they are not having any regular season at all. They are just kind of two big, big uh, weekends per week. So for us, it's basically every, every weekend, um, in the spring and autumn. So I would say that it's quite similar to Scandinavian schedule in this way. And I think it's super cool that uh, in this like, yeah, Czech Republic is not a huge country. So that's nice that uh, for most of the weekends, all the people from almost like whole country, they are, they are taking part in it because they know that it's going to be good events. It's going to be good organization and it's worth for them to travel for hours. Like, of course, they are still complaining that it's traveling for hours. But I think then if we compare it with Scandinavians that four hours for them, it's like normal. So then it's not a big deal. And um, um, let's say that our federation committee, they are always trying to make it quite like a balance through the country where the competitions are held. So yeah. it's not that it's all, all the spring is happening on one part of the country that it's always kind of trying to be balanced and uh, pick from the interesting um, terrains. And that's also like nice advantage of Czech Republic that we have pretty various types of terrain that every region is basically pretty specific. So I guess it, this is super nice and it's also quite cool and attractive for uh, many orientees in the whole country because then they are used to train in their region. Then, of course, they always use the opportunity to go to another region to compete in some completely new terrain, let's say, because it's pretty various. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, I think I can confirm. As I said, I've been visiting Czech Republic for uh, several events uh, in the past and uh, the, the organization was always very good. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not a person that requires much. So for me, it's like, you know, give me a good map, give me good courses, uh, make sure that there is toilet paper in the to toilet. <laughs> That's basically it. I mean, like, of course, then the level, it varies a bit if it's just some local regional competition for 200 people or if it's something bigger for one and a half thousand. So also like maybe by the level of uh, quality map or... I guess the toilet paper is for every event. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> or I believe, but with the rest, yeah, it, it depends, but I would say that it's super, super high. And as we know, also like Czech Republic is organizing every year, some big international event, either in Fudo, MTBO and, or something trail yeah. off. Example. So I guess then this kind of, uh, there is like, nice sample of organization to follow that uh there is like there are some groups where the organization uh committee is working pretty well so i guess that the other also like just local organizers they have many good samples to follow and i believe that there are also like nice guidelines from federation to made up and what is really required on which level so i guess it's going really nice and I recommend it for sure too. <laughs> all right. I, I also want to take an opportunity over here to just thank all the organizers that are doing the competitions that we can participate in. Uh, so without you, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to do this sport. And sometimes I know that 
some countries, even IOF, struggles with finding uh, the countries, people willing to host some of the events. So um, for, for all of you that actually put the work and allow us to have fun in the forest and in the cities, thank you, for, thank you very much. Yeah, um, I think it's just amazing because I think I, I've i seen it sometimes also in some kind of database that it was around 250 races, like official races uh, held in past season, which is crazy, crazy amount of uh, competition if you think about yes. how long the season. So of course there is a lot of locals, uh, locals races, but still it's it's quite high number. I mean, yeah, it's also what is super cool is that even though there is some big national event, then there is still, for example, three, four smaller regional event uh, happening for really like just a hobby runners. So that's nice that also it's not that all the focus is just put to national event. Right. And is just sitting at home, but they are usually having also opportunity to to go to some local events, and there is a lot of people just keen to travel to some another region, even though it's a lot like longer driving. But they really yeah. is the opportunity of uh, participating. So you're, you're not that big of a country. <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. But <laughs> you know, people always complain. <laughs> but yeah. I think, uh, yeah, orienteers are grateful in the end. Exactly. Um, all right, let's let's switch gears and go into uh, the national team level. Let's talk a little bit about national teams. So uh, you've been competing through throughout the whole ju junior career, and now you're competing as a senior as well. Um, how does uh, the the journey for the junior looks like uh, in, in in the national for the, in the national team? What do you need to do to get to the national team in Czech Republic? Well, so. It has changed slightly. Uh, like if I will compare how it was in my journey, uh, so from the youth to juniors, let's say just long story short, on the youth level, we had something as a national team with uh, regular training camps. And it was already kind of like first small step for the youth to get a bit into like how it is on some national level. So then, for example, for me, uh, it was quite easier when I went naturally to the junior level and to the junior national team. So I was ready for the system and the training camps. But currently it's more in the way that uh, for the youth, it's uh, putting more focus to work on the regionals level. So there are also like some uh, money coming to the official regional. I don't want to call it like center because it's not like any big training center. But let's say that in every region has some responsible person for organizing some regular activities for the youth. So it's more in this way. And then to get to the junior team, to the national to national team for some like selections. Uh, so I guess that it's mostly based on the results of the season, because also youth, they are participating in the Czech Cup in their own category. There is some... Uh, annual ranking done in all the competitions and then also on this youth level um, we are having I think I'm not sure if it's just once a year or twice a year maybe just once in the end of August there are usually some kind of big physical and technical test and also mental test it's kind of combining all the three aspects in one so the youth are running some uh, I think maybe three k test test race. Then they are doing oh. some four hundred interval, and in between they are doing some map activities. Then they are doing some kind of psychological test, uh, which is inspired by a Swiss system, I think. And then also some other um, kind of map activities uh, to how they understand the contours, some and some other features on the map, like basically. So by this, then they are kind of selected to these centers, uh, how it works on the youth level. And from these centers, then there can be some recommendation. But basically to get to the juniors, junior national team, it's done mostly on the results in the competition itself. Right. And but, but, but from what you're saying, I understand that it's more like for, uh, people are taken from based on the place in the ranking or is it uh, is there a selection race where you kind of or races maybe where you have to go participate and then based on the results on this specific or two three specific races you get selected so 
to get to the team, uh, usually it's in general also like for senior national team or this junior one. From what I know, it's just kind of done by looking at entire season and right. competition. Yeah. Uh, but of course, then we are having individual selection for every event, for example. Exactly. So, and those those selections are open. So, of course, like if there is some complete like random and new uh, newcomer from the winter who just rises up his level, then he's... It uh, happens. It happens in junior classes, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's uh, then for the selection, it's always like open to for everyone to participate. And do you have and like one selection race or, or several selection races? I think usually it's like three for the juniors, two or three. There is, there is always for... Also for the seniors, uh, part of the selection is the free K test, ra- test race, just just uh, track uh, track and field running, and then some. Um, and then I think it was for the juniors. It's usually just two, so in total it's like three. But it also depends uh, by the program of the Czech calendar, basically, because usually in this full schedule, uh, coaches are not able to prepare another special selection races just for the juniors and they want to open up uh, for the others. And then sometimes, for example, they a bit cooperate with the organizers of the races to make the equal distances for 18 class plus juniors together so they can like more compare the level in the spring for themselves. Yeah. What's and then your, are- what's, what, what, is, what is your time for free K? <laughs> That's uh, I like, yeah. My my PB, which is yeah. actually already six years old, <laughs> and I think I'm always kind of I can reach this PB. It's around ten fifteen, but I I have to mention that I really would love to try to make my PB. But for us as seniors, the problem is that uh, for this three K, we have some tap by the ranking for the time limit, basically. And as it's always part of the selection races, and it's usually the first race, so people are just running on the time which is set up by the tab. Right. So, so you that kind of you need to reach the threshold, but you need, exactly. don't need to like beat it by a margin. You don't get additional points for it. Yeah, exactly. So basically, just to imagine for women, it was uh, ten twenty five to mm-hmm. maximum points, and then there is every ten seconds is like losing one point for guys. Was it like eight fifteen and eight twenty five? Is it possible? I'm I'm not sure actually now, <laughs> but you can you can find it. So, but but the point what I want to say is that runners are usually trying to just run on the kind makes of sense. limit and not make the personal best. So, makes if sense. someone wants to make some personal best, then you should rather go to some uh, track and field competition. But, 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 but yeah, by the way, I also wanted to ask, is it, is it possible to um, read somewhere online, uh, for example, these uh, psychological tests that uh, you've mentioned about? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on the, for example, this psychological test, it's, uh, it's more like, yeah, I wouldn't say it's so much like psychological, it's more like by the, uh, yeah, like how... Yeah, it's I do, something between psychological intelligence, some at the attention test maybe, and I guess there is some something on the always on the national team. We have basically we have one, uh, and now I'm not sure if it's in English or in Czech Republic. I think it's in, in right. Czech but language. L- let's say let's say like let's say we don't want, we don't want to get into the details now. Uh, but yeah. if it's available online, we can just post the link and everybody interested can just follow the link. Yeah, yeah. basically we have one one page uh, for all the teams, which is split for the, there is like special special tabs for youth, junior and seniors. And this is all the website for teams. And you can find about all the activities even and so on. So all, And some report also from this test, for example. So okay. yeah, we can right. put the link if people are interested. Yeah, so, so if there is a sense with the link, I will put it into the description. <laughs> yes. uh, all right. Um, uh, so so uh, we know how it looks for juniors. How does it look for senior or in tiers? So for the seniors, basically, I would say that to get to the team, it's again kind of based on your results, mostly like international results on of JVOC or 
uh, Jack uh, European mm-hmm. European Junior Cup. Yeah, like Junior that. European Cup. Yeah. Junior European Cup. Yes. <laughs> so um, or also like then following some Czech ranking or some result of Czech uh, championships, let's say. So we don't have any strict kind of selections to get in the team. It's basically up to the coaches how they are deciding. Then they are calling to the athletes. Then they are making some list, discussing with the check uh, with the federation committee and people in it. And then it's going to be out and published. But uh, usually, um, also for the senior team, I think we have it, or maybe still like open that even after first World Cup run, which is going to be in Norway for next season, the coaches, they still might change the levels in the team or also like add someone to the team mm-hmm. uh, considering the considering the level, how it's going to be. So I would say that it's quite open in this way. Unfortunately, I wouldn't say that uh, the level of, all the Czech orienteers is not that high as Scandinavians. So it's more like you can really like see if someone is like capable of uh, being in the team that uh, I would say that those people are usually doing it, which is somehow nice, somehow yeah. it's sad. But I wouldn't huh? say if I'm like now having more experiences and comparing how is it, for example, in Finland as well, that the... Um, like a running field on the Finnish championship is crazy high and there can be like, there is always more than 20 uh, good runners in each category who yeah. can be a team and who, who can fight for the medal. So unfortunately, this is not so much a case of uh, of us in Czech Republic. So Yeah, I, I'm smiling because we have the same problem. <laughs> so I kind of, from the top of my head, I can list five people that will be in the... Uh, senior national team for the for the next five years probably um all right uh and then the selection races kind of look similar uh to junior you also have like one two uh, races plus the track track st- track test yeah yeah it, like it varies a lot by which season it is so for next year it's going to be a bit different because it's like first half of its forest disciplines mostly yeah but i guess even in this spring we are going to have some of 3k test race um plus some selections but we are not we are usually founding the info about selections uh, in uh, during january in the beginning of january but yeah usually it's like this it's uh, like few races uh and then there are like the, our criteria are kind of still somehow with open and coaches are keeping some um some uh, free hands in cases of some injuries and troubles. So it's yeah. really uh, it like, makes sense. It makes sense. Depends. So, but basically, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty open. And if there is really like something, uh, someone lifting up during the winter, there is always chance for him to participate. Yep. Um, and then, um, how many training camps do you usually have preparing you for the world champs, for example? Um, it's it's hard to say maybe like which one are really specific to preparing for world champs, but like in general we are having I would say one training camp per month or one and a month and a half. So for example in January we are gonna have a training camp just like physical one in Czech mountains. So we will just like do maybe one or two orienteering in the snow probably just to kind of break the routine a bit, bit but mostly mm-hmm. it's like entrance training camp but like specifically for for example world champs from what i know that during the spring uh spring period there will not be so many like there will be like maybe one big big one which is going to be in france but with like main focus for uh, getting some relevancy to the middle terrain for example for switzerland oh. And then, uh, then it's more like a uh, last focus. It's put in the last months before the work, but it, it's also, it also varies a lot on the budget of the team. And this is still kind of, for example, unclear that we are still not having exact numbers. So we are not having maybe 
for example, for next year versions, so many specific ones, but we had already had one after the World Cup in uh, Switzerland in this past season. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's like, by numbers, it's like less than five, but it's really on the individual way that then it's like recommended for like each of us to maybe take part in some competition, use some opportunities also of other other teams. And then like, uh, then it also depends of the team, like that uh, usually the team is selected one, one and a half month beforehand. So then like the most work is usually done after, uh, just just before the event. But it yeah. depends when we had a walk at the home, home uh, ground uh, two years back or 2021. Uh, so there was, let's say, like uh, preparation was in this like full Olympic block. So it was going on for four years and uh, many runners and also maybe including me, we were a bit like getting fed up by the sandstone terrain because we have just done too much. So, But it depends like it's individual. <laughs> What's your opinion? Did it pay off? Mm, <laughs> hard to say hard to say i mean in general we were maybe like as a team that uh, we were more disappointed than uh, happy with the result but i wouldn't i would see it personally that there were also more troubles not just like a problem of specific preparation but also maybe some um, kind of tension in the team and so on which is not maybe better to <laughs> open up uh, like publicly like this but I, I i believe that then um there was maybe some kind of high pressure that each of us kind of put like by by themselves to to the to showing some best performances so it, it didn't went in the best way kind of and they were maybe some like uh, important lessons again to take it for next years and let's see let's see let's see it's hard to know because for me it was still like for me it was like not big goal that I was really getting ready because I was still in the transition like period from juniors to seniors I haven't had so many years to really like focus it for this work and my goal there was not to take a medal so that's also like a different assets compared to some maybe all older members of our team but uh yeah like in general there were like some some uh for sure like a really nice positive side of it but maybe not maybe not that that high okay um I also want to ask about financing. So when you're a part of the national team and you're going for the training camps, um, how much do you have to pay for those training camps? Like in percentages, for example, or of the total fee, that uh, total cost of participating? So let's say I would. it's changing year by year by the finances from... Uh, we have something currently it's under like uh, nation sport agency, let's say. Mm -hmm. It's somehow like related to Olympic Committee, but maybe going a bit differently. But it's in the it's, it's as a part of Ministry of Sport. Yep. But I would say that past years uh, they've been really good for like economical situation of our Czech Federation. So if I'm comparing it also with some other nations, I would say that we are being really spoiled, <laughs> or like not spoiled like this. But I good think good for that you. Yeah, yeah, no, but I, I mean, like, uh, I'm personally sometimes from from what I heard some from some people in Czech team, like, kind of complaining, like, of course, like, we are not having that big budget as Scandinavians or Switzerland, probably, even though I don't know their numbers, but just by some feeling and like a luxury of training camps and so on. So of course we can't afford this, but still, if I'm kind of taking and um, which position of nation we are that we haven't been so like rising in past years with the amount of medals we are taking from the events that actually there was quite a long break to, like almost 10 years without any medal from international events. so considering all these factors i think that the economical situation is on a really nice level i would say that it's also 
maybe thanks to really nice work of many people in the federation who are like uh, having nice connections to to people in uh, good uh, good positions from other <laughs> other sectors and uh, organizations. To people who are holding the money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, but basically, back to the back to your question. Um, it depends also on which level of Czech team you are. So, if I will take, uh, how is it now for next season? So we are having six people in each category um, in A team, and then the rest is kind of B team. Mm -hmm. uh, so usually for A team, all of the training camps are for free if it's uh, if it's uh, on the home home ground. So usually flight tickets we are paying by by ourselves. But then the training camps itself they are for free. And B team it's uh, having like for example 50% support. And uh, then if you are selected for every international event you are having everything covered. So I think this is already a really nice standard that once you are getting to to national events, uh an international event, you are you don't need to like be thinking if you can afford it or not and you are just going. Maybe there might be some small changes because for example this year when for the European Champs in Estonia we haven't filling up the quotas we had from the IF basically because of the budget. And because uh, this uh, European Champs was the most expensive event from all the events past this year, which was mm -hmm. quite surprising if you consider that there were some events in Denmark, Switzerland, and so on. But for some reason, it was quite like big budget for the team. So there were just four four uh, athletes per, per category participating, even though we could have six, I think. So maybe there is some small thinking that uh for the next year they might be to have to kind of prevent this situation happen again because it's always nice to give opportunity to go to international event and we have people who might go there but yeah some for some reason there was no budget so it might be in the way that maybe there will be some selection and half of the people they will have it covered and second half they will have to pay some some fee yeah. they will not be that that, that strong but our head coach currently, from what I know, he's having this kind of philosophy that if you are really like among the best one who can show the performances that you shouldn't be participating and paying for it if if the budget is still on a good side for it. So that it shouldn't be in the way that we will take six people and everyone will pay 50%, that it should be rather in the way that three yeah. people have. As a coach myself, I absolutely agree. Like uh, yeah, if, you're, yeah. if you're going there to represent your nation uh during the national championship I, I i don't think you should be paying anything for it right this is uh your country asking you to go and perform not you asking the country to go and perform well, although it's also true <laughs> yeah i mean of course like somehow it it looks it, or it's kind of it should be normal but from what i know or i don't know maybe now situation is better but at least some years ago for brits for example they had to pay for all the events by themselves and then like mostly now when the prices are always rising. So it's it's quite it's quite a lot. Or also from what I heard, how is it in Finnish team, for example, it's also like maybe I was uh, having some expectation that with the financial support, it's on the better level than I than uh, than it is actually. So so yeah, uh, in this financial way, I think it's uh, on the nice nice yeah it's, it them. sounds optimistic and i think it's also like for example then there is this big factor and you in poland you have it as well that for example world games are quite big even in terms of uh, financial support for upcoming years yeah. even and mostly then if you manage to prove it so i mean we all among orienteers we know what the level at the world games that they are not all the best stars and of course you cannot kind of compare the value of medal from world games compared to VOC or AOC but still for some nations in Europe um, like to bring the medal from world games is even more important and for me kind of personally I I had like last during last winter I had it slightly in my mind that 
I would rather now choose to take a medal from World Games than from WOC, if I can just hypothetically say it like this, because I know that maybe this medal from World Games can help more to our like uh, all the federation situation and also to me personally with some kind of visibility because it's kind of big thing to to make a good achievement at the at the world games yeah by the way uh another question that came to my mind do you have like a military national team in orienteering yes yeah, so basically this is kind of new again or it they used they used to be some cooperation maybe 10 years ago mm -hmm. uh and this year uh we got luckily thanks to some people in the right position back to slightly some kind of military structure i wouldn't call it like military team uh but currently we got somehow like let's call it like one one position in a military sport center where you are having some uh, also like uh, sport support and s small financial support so we got one spot which is usually made for for one person but uh, as currently it's like there is me and also Thomas Krivda in men's category we are in some kind of good enough uh, high level so the coaches decided to split this position between me and him so we got freshly it's been just a few few months past we are in the structure of this sport military center which is supporting there is for example like those positions what i know it's like 60 position for all the sports which are in it so now we are having one let's see how it will go well, but th then th we are... this is like uh this is like a um it, it, it's it's like military supporting you financially somehow, uh, but yes. you're not really uh, a soldier, so to say. Exactly. Yeah, we are. We are having a contract which is called like instructor of sport. Okay. So, but like I would say that the your competencies are like to fill for the like representation on the best level and like having the best preparation and bringing up some bringing some medals from the will high you, will you be able to compete in the military uh, world champs uh, with this that's ongoing uh, discussion uh, like conversation right now uh it looks like that like we can't right now because we are not official soldiers but if we pass this uh base base training, training camp yeah. yeah we we can do this so Currently, it looks like that this training, because it's for two months in total or something, so it's quite long period. So maybe it can be scheduled for the end of next season. So then there is this military world games in 2024, I mm -hmm. believe. So in this one, yeah, it could be good to be there to compete because somehow it's also like important for for the sports center to send us there and yeah yeah through. that's why i'm asking because in, in poland uh there are um I, I don't know exactly but quite a lot of our senior national team is actually part of the military as well and, and they are like on military contracts they are soldiers really even yeah. though even though they are not doing any soldiering that they are that they are being paid essentially to focus on sports uh but because they are on a contract at the military one of their most important starts every year is the military champs because this is where um, they they need to perform well so that their contract is not you know invalidated and uh, extended for for the next years and also they get a chance to be promoted. So yeah, yeah, I, I know because I have talked to some Polish friends, <laughs> orienteers as well, and maybe I think also they have it like uh, maybe strictly that for some amount or like maybe one decade they have to be in a sport. I don't know how it works exactly with the contract, but basically for us the contract so far is just like one year thing, and it will depends how how it will go, uh, which uh, right, how so there are prospects for the future essentially. Yeah, exactly. But but yeah, basically so far I wouldn't say that. It's not such a big thing for us yet as for Polish team or maybe it's also like French team and some other teams, but it's on some good level. And also like currently what I heard because I had some uh, unique meeting with, for example, Ministry of Defense. 
So they are playing, planning to somehow induct orienteering training, like on the technical and also physical basis, bring into the structure of normal military training. So they kind of want to use us if they already have us now in the center to maybe prepare some special training for official soldiers, which is, I think, also a nice, nice way because, yeah, we can, I think we can see that some um, competencies of orienteers are, can, can be pretty um, useful for the soldiers in some way. And I think with this, it can also bring more popularity to the sport itself that it's like a, it's not just like some walking with the map, but that you can like really like that we are doing more things in pretty high speed because I think that people, if they don't follow it on the TV and they, they don't like, they don't have a chance to see it, how it's really going that then they are still like most of the population. It's hard to imagine for them, like what our sport is in on this like high level. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, I kind of feel like uh, you're making the whole circle when it comes to military and orienteering because orienteering came from military originally, right? And now yeah. they're saying, oh, it's useful. <laughs> I mean, like for me, it was quite a uh, quite tough uh, topic personally because let's say that somehow this connection for Czech national team they started to be popping up during the spring which we all know that was quite tough time in case of like military things and yeah. I'm a person because i have been quite a lot also in touch with substitute members of our uh if so then it was quite hard for me to just process it personally that i i might get the offer to be a part of some military sports center of course, it's not immediately like military, but still somehow it's related to Ministry of Defense. But in the same time, there was some ongoing conflict and I was like having some small personal like uh, troubles to just go through it. But in the same time, like, uh, yeah, it's it's like somehow made to support the sports. And actually, like we are having three different big sports central ones are more for like um university students second one is more for like uh, focus for example for olympic sport and then the sec the last one is in this kind of m under the military let's say so i believe that if the structure is already built up like this to offer some better condition for the athletes why not to use it because exactly. like uh, yeah it's good and it can help and it's not just for some personal support, but I believe it's for like uh, all the all the federation and also like bringing into the sport because like yeah, bringing some professional to already our kind of professional <laughs> professional amazing sport. Perfect. Uh, all right, so I was going to ask about uh, your uh, relationships inside the national team, but if you don't want to talk about it, and uh, maybe uh, you're probably right, maybe we shouldn't. Uh, then there is another question. Uh, what would you do if you could do anything to improve something in orienteering in Czech Republic in general or in, in the national team or uh, whatever comes to your mind? So some improvement that you feel like could be done uh, and uh, would be a good idea. Well, I would say that's a hard question. <laughs> I was it not is, yes. Because it's mostly like, let's say I'm still being nicely surprised by all the activities which are just popping up from like initiative from like federation or from some really special organizers and so on so there is always like kind of nice events and uh, projects for example currently what's super cool and maybe then it can be even like improved and kind of spread it more so it's some, I wouldn't translate it, it will not make sense. But basically the concept if uh, is that there is like one responsible person to arrange some training center opportunity abroad in some really attractive terrains. So let's say 
past, I think maybe two, three years ago, it was in Portugal or Spain. Last year it was in Sweden. For next year, it's going to be in Sweden again. And basically it means that one person is like organizer of this uh, training center. Mm-hmm. And the goal is to uh, prepare the huge training camp, which is lasting for eight weeks. And uh, with uh, set up trainings, uh, printed maps and so on. And it's offered to those regional centers I talked about in the beginning. And they can, or also the clubs, just the club themselves. Oh, and in cool. some, through some system, they can apply to it. Then this uh, person is arranging the, like the structure and setting, uh, setting like in which week who is going, because when they're applying, they're also putting like the ranked preferences for the term. So then they are trying to kind of synchronize this capacities usually for example 40 40 athletes and then uh it's much more easier for those other clubs or those just groups of orienteers with some maybe fre- uh, not friends but parents who are also orienteers to kind of uh just organize the travel but basically that's the only thing that what they have to do and yeah. then they are just coming to the place and they have accommodation and training set up and yeah then they are cooking by themselves but this is some extra stuff that you are doing whenever you are <laughs> you always have to eat <laughs> and cook yes. um, and then usually also on the top of this it there is try to for every week to have some ambassador uh, from the side of uh, other senior national team or junior or someone who is just on the side of senior team it depends because as it's during the july slash august it's quite busy period for national team but basically people who are also for example from former former like former runner they are using this opportunity to have some kind of small vacation for themselves uh and then as the ambassadors they are helping to teach uh, children how they can develop in this terrain. They are doing some analysis in the evenings with them. And uh, yeah, talking that, about that. That sounds awesome. I, I really like it. I mean, it's such a big help. I, I'm just thinking, you know, if, if this would be done here in Poland, it's such a big help for those uh, smaller clubs that have it tough, for example, to organize some training camps. Uh, and set you know all the controls by themselves to to make it uh, w- with good quality. Uh, and you're absolutely right. With this kind of uh, thing, they could just um, worry about travel and cooking, and the rest is over there. Uh, they, all they have to do is just pay for it. Yeah, exactly. I think it's super cool, and I was uh, just lucky enough that uh, some weeks ago I I took a part in in my current Czech club, which is kind of small like for example we have 80 members but like still on the elite there is less than 10 people Uh there is quite many kids but most of them also just like attending once a week some training and most of them they they never had even chance to i don't know run in opposite uh, side of czech republic so by this this is really nice opportunity how they can combine some kind of vacation and some trip to abroad and discover the orienteering uh, abroad and most in Scandinavia because for for us as a Central European runner, Scandinavia is still like the most beautiful in this way. It's True. nice. And uh, I have heard really nice feedback from the past year. So I'm really happy that uh, they are still uh, they are still repeating this. And maybe maybe at some point it can also uh, grown up in a big bigger way that there can be maybe like more different places going on same time but what's really nice that yeah exactly then you can have a group from one region when there is just five small children who will never go to training camp but they can join some bigger club from completely opposite side of the country and they will just meet together in this clubhouse and accommodation in sweden and spend one week together with someone who is helping them to just uh, learn orienteering and use compass because I think 
maybe this is also some second thing that I can <laughs> not like uh, recommend, but I will just emphasize the importance for Czech runners to really realize that Compass is good friend for you during orienteering. Because I think that in general, um, even though in our various terrain, that most of the time you have some huge features you can use like good navigation points. For example, in Sandstone, you have big pieces of like big uh, hills or like uh, yeah sculptures of sandstones. Then you have some uh, uh, perfectly ma mapped vegetation, which is, I think, if I'm like ever running, for example, in Scandinavia, I know that I I can never <laughs> believe the mapping style of vegetation in Scandinavia because they are not focusing for it at all. But in Czech Republic, it's always done great, like in really nice level because we have a lot of different types of vegetation. But then again, if you are always seeing some vegetation somewhere, at, it's in the map, you, you are not checking your compass so much. So in the end, then I think that some kind of, small weakness in general that when a, a career of orienteer is going slightly to the senior level that they are finding that still this use of compass is not the best and i am like saying from my own experiences because i have the feeling that even though i've been doing orienteering for past nine ten years i have just learned how to use my compass in past one or two years <laughs> which is like a bit sad to say it but in the same time, it's just showing that, um, yeah, maybe showing that uh, you can always learn something new. But I'm still not having a feeling that I'm confident enough to just my to, to just trust my compass. Yeah, I mean, you, you're definitely not alone. I I know lots of people like that. So I think that it's just like some uh, like big factor that like we are like people are saying, yeah, you have compass to put your map to just orient it north to the north. But like, this is not only thing you, you can use your compass <laughs> that you can yeah, really use it for keeping some right, di nice direction in your route choice. And I think this is something what can help a lot to, to like orienteering um, level in Czech Republic. So I'm just wondering if this is not the the answer to my last questions that I, that I was going to ask, but I will still ask it. What is the most important skill for them for an orienteer? You mean in general or in general? To... Yes. Mm, I think it varies a lot in which scale and the level and so on. No, you have to pick one. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> these are the rules. So I would go to this like high level and I would say keeping your focus, like uh, your concentrate, like, yeah, staying in your bubble and managing to be always concentrated just uh -huh. for what you should do. Because I think that, yeah, that's what's on the high level depends the most that everyone is or most of the people we are like perfectly physically ready. I would say that also as you are high level for some years, everyone is kind of able to adapt to the terrain, learn. Even though it's most demanding terrain, you can learn somehow some skills by the training, you can get ready for it. Yeah. So all these things, it's just kind of requires your time. So yeah, but it's always like, if you want to get better in something, just spend the time to do it. But then I think that uh, for this like, to show it in this important day, the most important is just to keep your focus and like, yeah, stay in your in your bubble and just focus for what you are doing because every second like this, it's counting and uh, you are just losing them. Exactly. All right. Thank you very much, Teresa, uh, for a wonderful talk. Lots of lots of information. I'm actually surprised how many things you know about orienteering in general uh in, in czech republic uh, i'm surprised because i don't know if i know that many details when it comes to polish or interior so really really awesome talk and well done uh thanks also for everyone that have been watching uh if you've uh, liked this video then give it a like if you're not subscribed then hit subscribe it uh, helps us get this information to more people all around the world so if you want to support us this is one of the ways of doing it also if you have any more questions uh, regarding uh, orienteering in Czech Republic, 
let us know in the comments. Uh, I, I will make sure that Teresa sees the questions and I, I'm sure she will do her best to answer them. Uh, but also let us know if uh, this is a kind of a video that you want to see more in the future and which country would you like to learn more uh, about when it comes to orienteering. So again, thank you very much, Teresa, for joining and uh, I'll be seeing you around. Thank you, everyone.